Our scripture lesson for this morning is a lectionary passage. It comes to us from the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 16 to 34. Listen to this intricate story, a story from our scriptures from which many sermons could be preached even on this one day. Listen now to God's word. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination brought, and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, saying, These men are the slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of the Most High God, Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, they dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans to adopt or observe. So the crowd joined in attacking them. The magistrates had stripped them of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. So, following those instructions, he kept them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and that all of the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that all the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were opened, and everyone's chains unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw this, he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. And so he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, but Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. So the jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Believe you and your household. They spoke on the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And so at the same hour of the night, he took them and he washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you trusting that your spirit is always moving. In situations of bondage and oppression and despair and dismay, that you are at work, even still, calling us forward, giving us life. We pray that your spirit will draw near to us, opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to your word for us. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation in all of our hearts will be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Siblings, what is it that motivates you? 
What wakes you up in the morning and compels you to get out of bed? What is it that guides you as you set priorities on your Outlook calendar, as you make decisions, as you make purchases, as you adopt an attitude for the day ahead? Now, it's no secret that researchers in many industries are trying to get to better understand the dynamics of human motivation. What is it that gets us moving in a certain direction? Whether we're adopting and trying to stick to a new diet plan, or a professional track of growth, or a purchase history. An article in the Harvard Business Review makes an interesting suggestion. The author states, people tend to think of themselves as stories. The author argues that if we can figure out what story people are trying to tell about themselves and enhance their story, then we can get to the heart of their motivation. So for example, he tells the story of some attorneys who were approached by the AARP. And these attorneys were asked if they would be willing to offer their services to needy senior citizens for a rate of $30 an hour. And unilaterally, these attorneys said no. So the AARP had a counterintuitive brainstorm. They then asked the lawyers if they would do it for free. And the answer was overwhelmingly yes. So why? The, the author argues that it is because people think of themselves as stories. He says, and I quote, when we consider whether to do something, we subconsciously ask ourselves this question. Am I the kind of, the pers of person who blank? And so, as we add money to this question, the lawyers, when they were offered $30 an hour, their question was, am I the kind of person who works for $30 an hour? And the answer was no. <clears throat> but when they were asked to do the same service as a favor, the question they asked themselves changed. They said then, am I the kind of person who helps people in need? And the answer, was yes. <clears throat> Our biblical text for this morning offers us a story with rich characters, with competing needs, and with many questions about motivation. Now, in many ways, the text I just read could serve as a longer case study in motivation. The individuals in this story are moved to action by a wide range of forces, some within their control and some outside of it. A girl is motivated by a spirit of divination that possesses her. Her owners are motivated by money. Paul is first motivated by annoyance. The crowd is motivated by fear-mongering hate speech and inaccurate assumptions. The prison doors and prisoners' chains were motivated by an earthquake. The jailer was motivated by fear and then gratitude and relief. And then he and his family were motivated by the word of God. Now this story reads like a game of dominoes, doesn't it? One person's motivation standing up in a line then tips over and evokes the action of another, which bumps into the next person's motivation and action, and so on and so on, until by the end of the story, everyone is changed. A girl is exercised from a spirit and liberated from slavery. Her owners are no longer able to exploit her. Paul is incarcerated and then released, just like all of the prisoners whose chains were broken when the earth shook under their feet. And a jailer's life is transformed. He's freed from his fears. He embraces God's word. He heals those he has harmed. And he is baptized by the same hands whose wounds he washed. Within 
the verses of our story today, everything is changed. Identities, hearts, livelihoods, beliefs, nobody is the same. The story affirms something that we've noticed and pondered and prayed about before. We are all connected. The aspirations and desires, the hopes and failures, sins and acts of service of all of the human family shape the entirety of the human condition. We impact each other. Our gas prices go up when a war is waged a half a world away. We get sick when a virus spreads across borders and oceans and travels across the globe. We experience summer and winter in the same week, not just because we live in Pittsburgh, but also because of the human production of greenhouse gases and how that has impacted the overall temperature of our entire planet. We can see how individual after individual are impacted by the motivations and actions of another. And sometimes we can connect the dots in straight and direct lines, and sometimes the dots we try to connect create lines that spiral around each other and fold in and of themselves. But we cannot escape the fact that we send ripples, and some of these ripples can be felt for generations. People tend to think of themselves as stories. Nine days ago, I received an email from my kid's preschool director. It was sent to all of the parents saying that the Department of Human Services required that all daycare facilities must participate in an annual emergency lockdown drill, which would be practiced the following week. The director gently assured the parents in that email that they would remind students that there was nothing to be afraid of as they sat huddled in a bathroom with their friends and their teachers and as they practiced being perfectly still and perfectly quiet. And so on Monday morning, my kid participated in this drill with other three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. And then less than 24 hours later, I, like other parents, hugged my kid tight. As parents and non-parents, as people in our nation and across the world were horrified and sickened and terrified when hearing the news that broke from Uvalde, Texas. I don't need to tell the details of that story, but unknown motivation led to actions that changed people's lives forever. Those actions sent ripples. Those ripples sent ripples. And see, we know that the events that unfolded earlier in the week did not occur in a vacuum. We can connect the dots to over 200 similar stories that have occurred since 1990 in our nation alone. We can connect the dots within another public health epidemic in which we live that has affected our society more than any other society across the globe. A crisis created by coalescing force motivating forces of money and power and fear and toxicity in our political arena of underfunded systems that are supposed to be supporting the physical, mental, emotional, and educational welfare of the most vulnerable. Now, I do not know what led an 18-year-old assailant through um, to make the choices he made that day. But I think it is safe to assume that teachers did not aspire or name themselves as heroes, that students did not aspire or name themselves as victims, and nor did anyone in that classroom or community view themselves as martyrs victimized by a society that prioritizes access, access to weaponry over the welfare of all. 
people tend to think of themselves as stories. So what is our story? As individuals, as a nation, as people of faith? If we were to fill in the blank of that question, are we a people who what? Now I know that some say that our nation is identified as the land of the free and the home of the brave. That's how we would fill in the last lines of that question. And I will confess that my prayers this week have been that this shared national identity would soon start to tell a larger story of a nation that works to ensure that children are free to learn without fear or of harm. And that those with troubles in body and mind and spirit are able to freely access the resources they need, the resources they need for their health. I want to tell the story of bravery of a bravery that motivates grown-ups, not just parents or teachers, but law enforcement and legislators and strangers who go to the polls to be brave enough to ensure the health, safety, and wholeness of all, especially the most vulnerable who have no voice. I want freedom to mean freedom from oppression. I want bravery to dismantle hate. I want freedom to mean free from hunger and the bravery to give from what we have to ensure the fullness of all bellies in our nation. I want freedom to mean free from fear and bravery to be measured by the strength of one's love. People tend to think of themselves as stories. And as a people of faith, we are people of a story. And if we go back for the text for today, the sacred word shows us that not only are we impacted by the motivation of human hearts and the actions that people make, but we are impacted by the motivation of God's spirit at work in our world. Because see, while humanity is busy doing what people do, things like getting annoyed, or trying to make money, or crying out for help, or doing their duty, God is on the move. In the midst of imperfect human motivations that manipulate and exploit human interaction, God is on the move, and God's spirit sets people free. The enslaved, the irritated, the duty-bound, the prisoner unjustly accused, and the prisoner convicted of their crimes alike. The young, the unnamed, the girl child, the Roman, Jewish, evangelist, miracle worker, they are all set free. In spite of and through human action and interaction, God brings justice, liberation, and new life to God's people. God's spirit writes and rewrites the story of human agency, calling us and all of humanity into a new way of being. A way of life in which no child is harmed by the greed of adults. A life in which prison doors are flung wide open and those who are released make a good choice for their community. A life where one's sense of identity and duty shift from being a part of the mechanisms that bring death to being part of the answer that brings life. See, this story, our story, is a story that gives me hope. In a season of grief or despair or confusion or fear, I give thanks that we worship a God who is on the move who is stirring human hearts and healing human wounds and liberating us from the forces that bind us or cause harm. I am grateful that we are a people of a story. But what does our story hold? Now see, I know that God is faithful. I know that God is working and that even when I feel like giving up, God never tires. I know that God loves us, that God hears our cries, is with us in our suffering, and is continually 
working to make all things and all of us new. But while I can preach the hope that comes from this truth, see, the story of our faith is not set up to be a quiet bedtime read that tucks us in at night. It's not meant to give us a false sense of comfort that allows us to rest in an armchair in the understanding that God will fix everything broken. And we then can be comforted by an inexhaustible God. But see, the story of our faith is also a story to motivate us, to call us to action, to engage us as dynamic characters caught up in God's agenda. Our faith invites us to take our place in the story, to participate in the story, to be the cast of characters not only upon whom through God that not only upon whom God works, but through whom God works as well. The story continues even today, not only in our thoughts or in our prayers, but through our faith made visible in action. So what do you bring to the story? Do you bring a willingness to cry out in truth even when you are annoying someone popular? Do you bring the courage to not be exploited by the forces of power that are trying to force the narrative of our day? Do you bring a passion to praise God in the wee hours of the night? even when darkness surrounds and you feel oppressed, to do the right thing when you've been given an easy way out? Do you bring a willingness to see things and other people differently? To put your hope and energy and sense of duty into doing the work of a living God rather than being a pawn in an oppressive regime? As a people of faith, as neighbors, as friends, we stand at a crossroads in our global history. The world is asking us to claim our narrative. So how will we answer the question of our day? When we, what will we say when we are asked, are you the kind of person who, what will fill in the blank? Will we be able to say that we are the kind of people who make the world safe for kids, who care for the most vulnerable in our society, that we are the kind of people who help to right wrongs, who enact justice, who instill hope? Will we be able to say that we are a people who collaborate with God to dismantle oppression that holds people hostage at the systemic and personal level? Will we be able to say that we are motivated by God's gracious love for us in Jesus Christ? Friends, we worship a God whose spirit moves among us with grace and alacrity, with beauty and might, inviting us to participate in this holy dance of liberation and justice, of wholeness and love. May we who hear God's call answer yes. May we answer yes to the story of a God whose love is made visible in our lives and through our lives. May we answer yes to an invitation to be part of the story of good news. May we say yes to what is possible when God is the force that claims us, compels us, and directs our every move. May we be motivated by God's love and love one another as God first loved us. May it be so. Amen.